Now that Major League Rugby is starting its fifth season of professional rugby union in the United States, I wanted to take a step back and take a look at the first fully professional national rugby competition in the United States, the Professional Rugby Organization or Pro Rugby. The competition only had five teams, even though it had aspired to include many more teams in future years. It started in April of 2016, but didn't even last a full year, folding in January of 2017. There's not too much information on the league out there. My question is simple. Did pro rugby do more to help rugby in the United States or do more to hurt it? Let's find out. So rugby football came to the United States in the 1800s, but the game slowly morphed into another type of football, American gridiron. After the United States won rugby at the 1920 Olympics, rugby was almost unheard of until the 70s when the United States played its first test match in decades against Australia in 1974. After this, there were several amateur regional competitions, but nothing fully professional. There was the Rugby Super League, which spanned from 1997 to 2013, but this competition, while including up to 12 teams at a time, was not fully professional. Perhaps that's a video for another day. After the Rugby Super League folded, there were several other attempts to get a fully professional competition in the USA. However, all of these attempts failed. Pro Rugby was the brainchild of Doug Schoeninger, a businessman and stockbroker from New York who became interested in rugby union both as a fan and a potential business opportunity. He was owner and CEO of Stadium Capital Financing Group which helped finance stadium construction, renovation, and expansion. I came in, you know, as a fan and, and, and as a business person at the same time. Rugby was on my radar, not probably top five, six, or seven, but it was there. In 2014, he missed out on buying a minor league baseball team, and that disappointment was what led him to rugby. He initially wanted to use the name NRL for the National Rugby League, but that name was already taken by the NRL in Australia. As a side note, the name Pro Rugby is horrible. You know how hard it is to look up information on this league by typing Pro Rugby? It's not like the computer knows if I make all the letters capital or say it like P-R-O. Such a generic name, you might as well call it the Rugby Sport Competition or something. Well, anyway, Schoeninger was the competition's first investor. He was the competition's only investor, but he wooed US rugby officials with the amount of money he was willing to spend on the sport. After officially getting sanctioned by USA Rugby in 2015, many people saw him as a savior that would finally bring pro rugby to the United States. Sacramento was named as the first city in early of November 2015. Schoeninger was impressed by the atmosphere while watching a Pacific Nations test match between the US national team and Japan. Cities like Philadelphia, New York, Toronto, Canada were floated, but in the end, the maiden inaugural season only contained five cities, three in California, one in Colorado, and the last one all the way over in Ohio. In the beginning, the teams only had the name of the city to identify them. They didn't have full team names, as the idea was to have fans decide what the team name should be using social media. What do you got going on here? We're gonna take advantage of the fact that we are after the social media revolution and not before, the kind of network presentation, which can be great for certain sports. It's probably not for us, it's probably a dinosaur on some level. So why would we jump on the back of a dinosaur at this point? Italian star Mirko Bergamasco, who played with Stade Francais and Racing 92, was the first officially signed player in March of 2016. Among other notable players were Phil McKenzie, who was one of the top rugby players from Canada who came with seven years of professional experience in England. Pro rugby had 102 players in total. Of those, 54 played rugby internationally, including 36 who played for the U.S. national team. The most notable player, Mills Muliana, who joined the competition midway through the year. With eight years of experience as an All Black and a storied professional career in New Zealand, he was by far the biggest name to associate with pro rugby. So the season was to start in mid-June and would end in late July. Each team would play 12 games with six home and six away matches. It was a very quick turnaround with the first official games taking place on April 17th of 2016. 
The opening weekend saw Denver win at home against Ohio, 16 to 13 with 2,300 people in a snowstorm, while Sacramento, in the first televised game to pro rugby, defeated San Francisco 37 to 25 amongst 3,400 fans. Early on in the season, Canadian Phil McKenzie of San Diego expressed his initial views on pro rugby during an interview with The Province, a British Columbia newspaper. It succeeded in every facet. I don't really know what I was getting into, but I came with an open mind. The facilities are amazing. They train us like we're any other pro athlete. It's awesome. Midway through the season, the teams were announced with the following names. Denver Stampede, Ohio Aviators, San Diego Breakers, San Francisco Rush, and the Sacramento Express. With the teams named, the rest of the season went pretty smoothly on the surface with no apparent issues. Fan engagement was decent for a fledgling competition. Crowd sized averaged about 1,700 people, which is comparable to a minor league baseball team. The championship was actually decided solely from the regular season standings, that is, there were no playoffs. There was some confusion with the last game as coincidentally the first place team Denver played against the second place team Ohio. Even though Ohio won the last game 32 to 25 in a thrilling finish, Denver ended up winning the overall standings due to gaining an extra bonus point from scoring four or more tries. Fans were understandably confused. Just need to set things up here, the aviators. They come down the blind side now. Quick hand. rugby as well. Hang on a second, we've just been told by the officials that with the bonus point structure, Denver's going to hold on. They'll take a bonus point out of it. Bumps them one up. They've got four tries. They're within seven. Two bonus points. They're going to win by one point. We talked about this in the pregame. The mathematics of this was mind-boggling at times, but Denver will hold on and they will win by one point on the point standings. Overall, the season was a success, and most fans were excited for a second season. But why didn't that happen? Well, it all revolves around two things. The USA sanctioning of pro rugby, and pro rugby's owner, Doug Schoeninger, being a cheap piece of sh**. So let me start by saying that sanctioning is a big deal. A player must play for a sanctioned competition in order to be eligible to represent his or her nation internationally. Before the start of the competition, Doug Schoeninger set up a sanctioning agreement with USA Rugby for the duration of three years with former CEO Nigel Melville. Schoeninger's complaint was that USA Rugby never fully accepted pro rugby as a legitimate competition. He says that the US national team coach, USA Rugby board members, and the CEO only attended one game in total. He was, in short, unhappy with the integration. Additionally, USA Rugby was to provide about $4 million in sponsorship money to the organization, of which only 100000 actually materialized. This caused Schoeninger to spend much more than the initial $2 million he planned to pay on the nascent competition. Somewhere during the initial first season, the relationship between Schoeninger and USA Rugby soured. New CEO Dan Payne was installed. He probably took one look at Schoeninger's reputation and ongoing complaints and said, screw that. After a day-long meeting, it was decided that USA Rugby would no longer continue their exclusive licensing agreement with Pro Rugby. I said no. So there was a meeting uh, the board was having, I think, with, uh, with the Congress in, outside of Denver at the end of August. And I went there. And honestly, in business, and I've been around business quite a bit, I've never been more insulted. I went there with a day's notice. I got lectured on how uh, we were not a cooperative, even though when I asked what was uncooperative about us or anyone who worked for us, there was not one example. Um, I guess they were talking about Pro 12, I'm not sure. And from when I came back to, the, uh, from, to New York, I mentioned to the guys in the office, I said, we just should shut down. This is it. I mean, they pushed me too far. 
players signed contracts that made them 12 month rugby players and it was agreed that their payments would spread out over 12 months instead of just a period of time that they worked. It's kind of similar to how teachers work 10 months but get paychecks all year even during the summer months that they have off. So the problem here is after USA Rugby eliminated their sanctioning, Schoeninger immediately canceled all contracts going against his previous promise to pay players for the entire year. So as you can imagine, many players and staff have taken Schoeninger to court. Mills Muliana was quoted as saying that there was a lot said that they didn't provide. Mills Muliana, the 97th top point scorer in Test Rugby, had to take the owner of Pro Rugby to court to recoup 20,000 in lost wages. How embarrassing is that, you know? So it's clear that after one long careful look at Schoeninger's history of not paying people on time, that he should never have had the opportunity to run pro rugby in the first place. But ultimately, because of Doug's reputation for paying players late and not paying vendors, that reputation was out there. And these people were not responsive as far as using us. And the questions were always asked, does this guy pay his bills on time? We're hearing that he's not paying employees on time. And it becomes very difficult at a certain point to maintain a positive outlook. But when somebody does the work for you and they, they graciously allowed you to pay them over 12 months, you pay your bill. I'm sorry, you pay your bill. If you want to have a league, you pay your bill. But did Pro do any good? Well, it did give Americans an initial idea of what professional rugby would look like in the United States. Yeah, but I think it was one of the benefits of pro rugby was that some of these guys were able to enjoy or um, be exposed to daily training environments, which they hadn't before. Um, I think many of them struggled, uh, many of them prospered, and actually quite a few of those guys have come through now and are performing pretty well with uh, the national team. So I think from that perspective, uh, it, it was a success because it introduced, say, 150 American players who hitherto had not got up every day and done rugby and they were able to do that. So that hopefully um, will be, you know, we'll see the results of that hopefully in the next couple of years. Does pro rugby have any lasting legacy? I don't know if that's likely. However, former player turned coach Taylor Howden reactivated the team name Ohio Aviators when they played the 2020 World Tens Tournament in Bermuda. So that's kind of cool. Dylan Fawcett from Rugby New York and Riker Hedding from the Seattle Seawolves are both captains of their respective teams and also pro rugby alumni. So I think above all, knowing this rocky start to professionalism in our country can help us truly put into perspective how fortunate we are to be in our fifth season of MLR, despite all the setbacks and problems we might have with this league. I hope this video was helpful and that you enjoyed it. Uh, like and subscribe if you want to, um, and check out my channel for more videos. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys. Five years down the road, you and I sit back here. What do you think the conversation would be? You'll be asking me, did I know then how successful this game will be?